Well, let's first off by introducing yourself to our viewers. If they don't know you, they may know your name, but they don't know, necessarily know you. Tell us about how you got to this spot yeah. today. <laughs> you know, um, my trajectory into politics is not the typical one. I actually, my mother brought me here when I was very young. I was 14 when she brought my sisters and I from Ecuador. Uh, my family lived under a military dictatorship. She knew that she wanted to provide us with opportunities that she wasn't going to be able to give us in our home country. And we came here for those e opportunities, opportunities to be able to reach our dreams, our goals, for safety, and for freedom. Mm -hmm. And someone asked me recently, what did you feel when you first got here to the United States? And I remember feeling extremely safe, you know? And, and then unfortunately, we have been living in a state where they have been attacking our freedoms for years now. Um, I was very fortunate to have worked at FIU at the medical school for a while. I became the associate dean at the medical school and I was trying to expand access to healthcare to underserved communities mm -hmm. in South Florida. And that was the time when we were seeing attacks to eliminate the Affordable Care Act, which Rick Scott has said time and time again, he wants to lead that effort to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. That's what prompted me to run back in 2018. And so many people thought at the time that it was impossible for somebody like myself to be elected because I wasn't in politics. I, that hadn't been my trajectory. And, but I knew what the community needed. I knew that they wanted change. We worked really closely together. And because of them, because of my community in South Florida, I won. I mm -hmm. beat someone that everyone thought it was hard to beat. Mm -hmm. And here we are again, and I have the pulse on our state. Mm -hmm. I'm extremely, extremely proud to be a Floridian. I've been traveling the state now for over a year. Mm -hmm. And the issues that are facing people in Tallahassee, Gainesville, Jacksonville, Miami, it's all the same issues. People can't afford to live here. We have skyrocketing property insurance rates. My mom lives with me and I've been seeing her struggle with her health for a while now. And if it weren't for Medicare and Social Security, I don't know where she would be. I, I watched her work 12 hour shifts for years to be able to pay into that benefit that she now has. Rick Scott wrote a plan to eliminate Medicare and Social Security. Rick Scott wants to raise taxes on middle class families. And so instead of doing things that are going to help our families living in the state of Florida, he's making it harder. He's been in government for 14 years. And what I've seen across the state is that Floridians are ready for change and they want someone that's going to be working for them. Because I've gone through so many struggles, I know what it's like and, and that's what I want to do when I get to Washington. You know, I'm curious how you feel about the attack ads because you talked about your upbringing mm. and why you came to America, why your family came mm. here to escape dictatorship yeah. and to have a fresh start. And now, as we've seen countless cycles now, uh, a popular thing from your opponents uh, from the GOP side is calling uh, a lot of Democrats socialists yeah. and saying that this was, quote, the most mm. socialist ticket with Harris, Walls, mm. and yourself coming from a Rick Scott attack ad, how do you get the message across to the voters mm -hmm. that that is not how you will operate? Mm -hmm. how, what, how do you message that? You know, and it's the same false ad attacks that they've been launching for years. Uh, it's actually an insult. It's an insult, not just to myself, but to my mother's legacy, mm -hmm. the work that she did to bring us here for safety and to the legacy of so many Latino families that have come here to the United States mm -hmm. and are living in the state of Florida to see and hear those horrible attacks. And they've been debunked. Mm -hmm. And what I have to say is people need to pay attention because he's using those attacks because he doesn't want you to know that he's the one robbing our freedoms. He's the one trying to take away the dignity for seniors to retire. He's the one that wants to take away your health care. He's the one that has said that he proudly supports a six-week ban on abortion, which is an extreme ban, which poses a health risk to so many women living here in the state of Florida. And what I've seen from living in these countries, when a politician like Rick Scott starts taking away one freedom, they never stop there. Yes. He has voted against access to IVF, but he has an ad saying he wants to protect access to IVF. That should tell you everything you need to know about Rick Scott. He lies. Why? Because he has been using that seat for personal gain. That's all he cares about. He wants to become Senate Majority Leader. And we know that if he gets back into the Senate, 
He will push for a national abortion ban. He will lead the effort to eliminate the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. He will do nothing to reduce the cost of living for Floridians here. And Floridians deserve better. And, I, and I've been having these conversations with people everywhere I go, here in Orlando, in Central Florida. They're doing the work to make the changes that we need in our state. When we look back at the midterm election in 2022, the state obviously had a lopsided result from what we've been accustomed to seeing. And a big reason for that was what happened in Miami-Dade County mm -hmm. and the flip that that had. Is that here to stay, in your opinion, as someone yeah. who lives there and has lived there? Or is that, was that just a blip on the radar? What, what gives you confidence that that is not here to stay. Look, Miami-Dade County is a very diverse community and uh, close to 70% of the people that live in Miami-Dade County are Hispanic, Hispanic descent. Um, but we have Haitian Americans, we have Caribbean Americans, Central Americans that are working 60 hour days, right? And so if you're not talking to, to these families, if you're not talking to these voters, they're not going to have the information to empower them to make the right choices when they come to the ballot box. And I think that's what happened in 2022. We didn't see an organizing effort. 2020, we had the pandemic. A lot of people were completely isolated. You have to be talking to your voters, whether they're Latinos mm -hmm. or not. I mean, that's that's how it works. If you're not there doing the outreach that you need to, to make, to give them the option, to have the information in front of them, mm -hmm. then you lose those votes. But Latino voters, especially in South Florida, have always also been you know, a swing vote. And what I know is that they identify with my story. They know, uh, they know that story of coming here to work hard, to contribute, to give opportunities for your children, to make sure that your children have a better life than the one that you had in your home country. And so I can tell you that a lot of people in, in South Florida are excited. They're excited about having this choice in November. What's the biggest issue on the ballot this year, um, in just less than 50 days, what, is, what do you see as the biggest issue and what is on the ballot? What is at risk on the ballot? So there are two and, and it comes up everywhere I go. Again, and it doesn't matter if I'm talking to students at FAMU or if I'm talking to a senior in the panhandle, the high cost of living, mm -hmm. inflation, we have a higher rate of inflation here in Florida than we do in the rest of the country because of failed policies that began under Rick Scott when he was governor here. I mean, let's remember, I'm gonna say it again, he's been in government for 14 years and really hasn't done anything to help us here in the state. Uh, the, the skyrocketing property insurance rate started under Rick Scott. He gave $53 million to his campaign contributors, to insurance companies that came and were able to pick the low risk properties, then left the market and left tens of thousands of people without insurance. Um, but also abortion, I, I can, honestly say that whether I'm talking to women, conservative women, even men have told me that this is one of their main issues in this election. They can't believe that this state has passed such an extreme ban that poses a risk uh, for the health of the woman. It should be a private matter. Government should not be interfering in that decision. It should be between a woman and her doctor, her family, her faith. I'm a mom, I have two daughters. And I want to make sure that they live in a state that they can have access to this critical and central health care for a woman. Mm -hmm. And Rick Scott, again, has been saying time and time again, he opposes Amendment 4. He supports the six-week ban. He would have signed it into law if he were governor. He's extreme. He has been um, supporting candidates that support the life at conception bill, which means you have no access to contraception or IVF. Mm -hmm. that, that's as direct as it can get. And um, it is central, not only, like I said, to our health care, to our dignity, but to our safety. Mm -hmm. And so we need, if you care about democracy and women's rights, they go hand in hand. We need to protect that freedom for women. Let's go back to the high cost of living. Do you think the uh, Biden administration has done enough to curb that? And what can they do? What would you do differently? What are your policy yeah. ideas to help out everyday Americans well, and everyday Floridians? You know, they've taken some good steps and they passed the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, that Rick Scott voted against. And what it did is it made certain investments to reduce the cost of goods and services, including medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, they were able to cap the cost of insulin at $35. And that's an important issue to point out because working in healthcare myself, too many families have been struggling with the cost of medicine. 
Rick Scott wants to repeal that, and I'm going to keep bringing up the contrast so that people know that they have a choice. We need to continue to bring down the price of medicine. We need to make sure that we lower property insurance rates. There's a bill that I can lead in the Senate. I've already proposed it. It's on my website mm -hmm. that you can take a look. It would lower property insurance rates by 25%. We need to bring good paying jobs. Too many people here are leaving the state because not only can they not afford to pay for their rent, they can't buy their first home, they're going to other states where it's a little bit easier for them to do that, but we're not getting companies that are coming to our state to invest. Mm -hmm. But why would they if they're attacking our system of higher education, if women are not going to have access to reproductive freedom? if uh, you have a governor that is sending election police if you're signing a ballot to support an amendment. I mean, that doesn't incentivize business investments. Companies are going to look elsewhere to go and bring their employees. So we have to be smarter about this. And I'm willing to sit and talk to anyone that was to, wants to work with me in the Senate, Republicans, Democrats, but we need to start somewhere and we need to really stop this chaotic and hateful politics that we've been living under here in the state for too long. Yeah, the, the bipartisanship is, I think some people will tell you, yes, I do want to work across the aisle, and some people are like, I'm going with. Is that something, will you be a party line vote on things? It, it, I think that's what, it, especially in a state like Florida, where it kind of flip-flops and yeah. people are more so in the middle than anything, and they lean another way. Is that something that you will do as a senator, is work across the aisle and get things done, even if it's not a Democratic bill? So you have my commitment, and I'm, I'm talking to you, Florida. You have my commitment that I will do that, and I did that when I was in Congress. Mm -hmm. um, Francis Rooney, he's a very conservative. He was a very conservative member of the Republican caucus from our state, and we became friends, and we talked about what we cared about. He cared about coral reefs, as I did, and we wrote a bill together to bring funding to protect the coral reefs along the coast. The environment has always been very important to me and, and to the district that I represented, and to Florida, of course. Mm -hmm. And so we did work with Brian Mast. I did work with him to protect our waterways, which is also critical to the health of our environment, of our water, and also central to our economy. So I did that at FIU. You know, when you work in a university in Miami-Dade County in Florida, you have friends that are Republicans. I mean, we are a very diverse state. There's nothing wrong with that. You can differ in policy issues. You can be friends, talk about reaching compromise. That's what we need to do. I'm going to ask you some questions. Just these are based on viewer feedback that we've had. So, and some of these might be doubling up on what we've already talked about, and if you don't mind just uh, answering those. So, one of the questions is, what expertise will you be able to bring to Congress if elected? Yes, and so I, I studied very hard in college. I was able to get a degree, my master's degree was in political economy, so I've always looked at ways that we can combine good economic policy with government to bring opportunities to families. My record on higher education for many years shows that I had a commitment, and I always have had a commitment to bring the resources available that we had to expand access to good coverage, to mm -hmm. good medical care. In Congress, I passed a bill to expand Medicare uh, coverage for seniors. In Congress, I led an effort to bring $200 million for Everglades restoration. I was also the, um, vice chair of the women's caucus and one of the things that we did is propose a policy plan to bring higher wages for women because that's that's a way to also support families we need to expand child care for example um, i have always been a, a big proponent of supporting our teachers and our public education system but also reducing gun violence this is an issue that's very personal to me and for many years, uh, I've worked with different organizations to reduce gun violence, to save the lives of our children. I lost my father when I was 24 years old to gun violence. And it's a pain that connects you to too many families. I've, I've met too many families in Florida here from Orlando mm -hmm. who lost their loved ones at Pulse, Marjorie Soman Douglas and families across the country. And we did a lot. We were able to pass the universal background check bill in the House. It never passed the Senate because at that time it had a Republican majority. We need to stop putting the gun lobby's interest before the lives of our children. And we are experiencing higher rates of gun violence here in the state of Florida because they passed that permitless carry bill. So mm -hmm. I've done a lot of work uh, in Congress and I want to continue to do that. And those are just some of the issues that I would lead on. 
again, we've talked about it, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, what do you see as the three biggest priorities for Floridians, which you've touched on? Um, and how would you help your constituents with those problems and those priorities if elected? So everything about my campaign has been about freedom and three things under that bucket of freedom. The freedom for families to be able to work and make it here and thrive in Florida. We shouldn't just provide uh, uh, better opportunities, mm -hmm. they should be able to thrive in our state. The freedom for seniors to retire with dignity, to know that they can count on Medicare, Social Security, programs that they've been paying into their entire lives, and the freedom for women to make their own reproductive health care choices. I think that uh, those are the top three issues, top three issues that will lead me in everything that I do once I get mm -hmm. to the Senate. And uh, this is how our viewers have tiered it. Again, not a surprise based on, I'm sure, the feedback that you've received, but border security and immigration mm -hmm. reform is first, economy, cost of living, and then abortion. Yeah. We have not talked about border security and immigration yeah. reform. What are your viewpoints on there? Is the border, un is it a crisis right yeah. now? And what needs to happen in your eyes? Look, we've seen the crisis that have, I completely agree. I think that there is a lot that we need to do at the border. We have seen high numbers of people coming to the border and the problem, part of the problem has been that there hasn't been border security. Why? Because Congress has not sent the funding that Customs and Border Patrol needs. Now there was a bipartisan bill that came to the Senate. Mm -hmm. It came up twice for a vote. Rick Scott voted against that. What that meant is that he was voting against funding for Customs and Border Patrol. He was voting against funding to stop the trafficking of fentanyl and funding against our law enforcement officers. I mean, this is exactly what was in that bill. Again, these bills are never perfect, but one of the writers of that bill was a very conservative member of the Senate Republican Caucus mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. And they did it to use this point to continue to divide us. And you need to have courage to sit at the table and say, yes, we have a crisis at the border. What are we going to do about it? But the issue of the border is so much larger than just sending money to protect our border. It's, it's very complicated. We have a very extreme and dangerous situation going on in Venezuela, where you have a dictator, Maduro, who stole the election the 28th of July. Venezuelans are fleeing. The Edmundo Gonzalez, who won that election, had to flee the country. Mm -hmm. And so it's no surprise that we're seeing more and more people coming for safety to the United States. We need to work with the hemisphere, with Central America, with South America, to make sure that people can remain in their countries. We need to support the people of Venezuela. We need to support the people of Nicaragua. They're fighting for democracy and freedom in, the, in these countries. We have an extreme si situation in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And what is Rick Scott doing? siding with someone that is accusing and making racist remarks to Haitian Americans. Let's remember, we have almost half a million Haitian Americans living in the state of Florida. And so let's talk about the issues, but let's not use hateful rhetoric to accuse immigrants of all the problems that we have in America. We have a lot of problems. It's not just accusing immigrants of all those issues. You know, so many viewers have told us that they're concerned about um, social security benefits and those not keeping up with their monthly expenses, the costs of living. So if elected, would you support effects to close this gap? So, i.e. ending social security taxes and or changing the formula that calculates what those monthly benefits yeah. are supposed to be each year? So the first thing we need to do is protect social security because I have been talking to a lot of seniors and they're worried about that. and. Uh, from a personal experience, my mom, I, her, her social security check is minimal. Mm -hmm. I mean, if she lives with me, if she didn't live with me, she wouldn't be able to survive. I, I can tell you that. that that money would not be able to help her pay for all, all the costs that she has medicine, you know, groceries, it, it would be very difficult for her to make it. And a lot of seniors are facing the same reality. They're being forced to go back to work here mm -hmm. in the state of Florida because it's so expensive to live here. But, you know, from personal experience, seeing my mom struggle with that Social Security check and then having so many conversations, I met a woman at the Panhandle. Um, it was late in the evening. I had an event for the campaign, and she picked me up in her Uber, and she told me she had retired from a huge accounting firm, mm -hmm. but she was forced to go back to work driving an Uber at night. This is a woman in her late 60s because she couldn't afford to pay for her property insurance rates. I mean, those are the stories that I hear. So we need to make sure that Social Security 
We continue to make increases in the payments adjusted to inflation. I know that this administration did that, but it was still not enough. Mm -hmm. um, I do support, of course, not paying taxes. If you're getting a minimal, a minimal amount in your Social Security check, you're, you're probably not going to have to pay taxes because you're not at that income level, right? So, um, but how do we expand that coverage? And that's the question. And it's a revenue question. Where, where can we get the revenue stream to be able to support our seniors living in the state? We talked a little bit about the insurance crisis, home and homeowners insurance, um, that, but also auto insurance is way up. What can be done? Because we know the state, what they have done uh, here at the state level and passing a lot of reform yeah. to try to get a hold of this. Obviously, that takes time, but it seems like it's getting to more of a stabilized market. But what can be done at the federal level to assist with the cost of insurance in this country? You know, it, it, part of the problem, and like I said, this did start back when uh, Rick Scott was governor, that he took that public option funding from mm -hmm. citizens and then gave it to private insurance companies, and they weren't expanding their risk, they left the market, it started the mess that we're in. But it's also closely linked to the impacts of climate change. I mean, a lot of the insurance companies are extremely concerned that we're seeing, like we all know, stronger and stronger storms. So we need to make sure that we bring the right investments to, to invest in climate resiliency. Uh, we need to deal with the impacts of climate change. How are we going to adapt a lot of these coastal communities to sea level rise? Mm -hmm. That's something that I worked on when I was in Congress. So that's part of it. We have to deal with that. But also, we are going to have to look at ways to have a federally backed program for a lot of these properties. There are coastal communities right now that are facing the reality that they may not be able to live there 20, 30 years from now. and. We are experiencing warmer oceans. We know that that's affecting the coral reefs. I mean, all of those issues are connected and you have to look at this in a larger, you know, with a larger vision mm -hmm. of all the different aspects that are tying into the high cost of insurance here in the state of Florida. Let me ask you this. Uh, when you look at the you versus Senator Rick Scott, he has a lot of experience in politics, obviously governor of Florida, one-term senator, you have one term in Congress. Is that something that comes up on the campaign trail, talking about the experience difference, and does that hurt you, or do you feel like at the same time it might help you? So I would say that he has a lot of experience lying to Floridians. I mean, that's exactly what he's been doing, and you can just look at his record. And when you talk about accomplishments, I would love to hear from the senator himself what he has accomplished, because what he's been able to do for many years is just vote no. That doesn't take a whole lot of effort. It doesn't take a whole lot of work. Um, he's been, you know, following the former president to his trials in New York instead of being in the Senate, taking the votes that he needs to take. Uh, as a woman, I can tell you, I'm a mom. I have three kids. My mom li lives with me. And when I was in Congress, I took the responsibility to serve the people in Florida's 26th district very seriously, but when you're there, you're there to make things happen. Mm -hmm. I'm not there to waste time or anybody's time. You know that when you have a family that you have to get back to and take care of as, as well. So I consider myself, I've always considered myself a working mom and, and for all the working moms out there, you know what I'm talking about. You go and, and you get things done. So I don't really see a whole lot of accomplishment from Rick Scott. What I can tell you is people do know who he is and they're just ready to vote him out. In November. He, is, um, he is, has success winning elections, mm -hmm. um, often by razor thin margins. I think every single time he doesn't reach the 50% threshold, but he wins elections. What gives you confidence that this is the time where he doesn't win the election? Well, what I've, a lot of my optimism comes from the people of Florida. It, it, people are organizing and mobilizing in a way that I haven't seen in years. Has that changed since the top of the ticket has changed? There's been more energy. I've seen yeah. it grow. Uh -huh. And yes, there was even much quicker growth right after the vice president announced her candidacy. Yes. Um, but I also think it's because of all the extreme attacks that we've been facing in our state. I mean, we have an extreme legislature that has been attacking our public education system. Um, some of our the most vulnerable communities among us, uh, municipalities, not allowing them to make their own decisions as it pertains to local government. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of attacks 
that we've been feeling. And I think a lot of people are just tired of that, attacking unions, right? The right for workers to be able to organize in our state, which they should, in a, in a democracy, that's how it works. Um, but I think, I think uh, Rick Scott's luck is about to run out, and I'll tell you why. He has never won by more than a percentage point, and he's never run in a presidential election. He's never run against the millions of women and men that are going to come out to support Amendment 4. Mm. And what I tell everyone is, just remember, we need 60% to pass Amendment 4, which I fully support. All I need is 50 plus 1, mm -hmm. and that's what has me very optimistic about this race. There's no concern that there are more Republicans than ever registered Republicans in the state of Florida. I think it's by a million now registered Republicans versus Democrats. No concern with that. So what I've seen is that they've been purging voters off the rolls for the past couple of years. And, and it seems like they're trying to continue to do that. Uh, some of the latest reports that I've seen, which is against federal law, by the way, 90 days before an election. You should not be kicking voters off the rolls 90 days before an election. That's federal law. Um, Republicans haven't gained a million voters. They've only gained a few thousand voters when you compare the registration rates 2024 versus 2020. Mm. But this purging of the rolls, yes, that concerns me, absolutely. And what I have also seen, though, is that there are a lot of students all across the state that are registering to vote. We need a, a lot more of that. And we do need also our independents to come and vote. All these special elections that we've seen, including in the August primary, independents have come out to vote for the Democrats in, in these elections. Mm -hmm. When you have Democrats combined with independents, we win all of these races. How has it been as far as, well, monetarily and, and investing in the state of Florida mm -hmm. from the Democratic National Committee, has that changed? Because I, I, you know, you go back to 2022, and that's you know the most recent history we have. It didn't seem like they had any thought that that um, former uh, Congresswoman uh, Val Demings had any shot to yeah. beat Marco Rubio. So they didn't really give it the money that it needed, and we saw what happened. Does that is that changing now in this election year? Have you seen that change? What what can you tell us about that? So. I've always said this is a race that I am going to run myself. I'm really proud of what we've done with my team in building this race to get us to where we are, a point behind Rick Scott. I mean, we're basically on a statistical tie. All I can do is continue to run my race and remind everyone that we need to keep the Senate majority. And the best opportunity for us to be able to do that is by winning Florida. Look. I know that there's a lot of excitement for the vice president, and I know that there are a lot of people working to help the vice president become the first woman president that we've ever had here in this country. But she won't be able to build on the progress that she wants to build upon, reducing the price of medicine, investing in climate resiliency, making sure that she provides good quality education and funding for our schools here in the state of Florida. None of that will be possible if Rick Scott gets reelected and then he wants to become Senate Majority Leader, but I always say, you know, he's going to have to run through me first. But then he gets reelected and then tries to stop any sort of bill from passing the Senate. I've lived that already. That's not the way government should work. Mm -hmm. And that's why this race is so important. If there's a Republican watching right now who is dead set on going down the ticket, R, 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 what would your message be to them to convince them to try this, to try you out? Um, you know, a lot of the issues that I talk about and the issues that I want to work on shouldn't be political. Mm -hmm. I support in protecting our national security and protecting our border. There's no question about that. But I also support reducing the price of medicine. I also support reducing the cost of living, making sure that our children are proud to live in our state and that they have the opportunities to go to school, have a good paying job, thrive in the state of Florida. We should be leading. We're the sunshine state. We should be leading in a lot of these programs. The environment for me has been extremely important, protecting the Everglades, protecting our coastal communities, our fisheries. I have fishermen that are helping me in this campaign because they've seen the work that I've done over the years. Uh, the one thing that I would say is I, I'm, I'm in the middle. I always have been. And I want to do the work for every Flo Floridian, regardless of political affiliation. Mm -hmm. And even if they are not convinced, no matter what happens, when I get to the Senate, I will be working for every single Floridian.
in this political climate, does policy even matter anymore? I, I know hope it, so. I know it does. <laughs> it does. Yeah. yeah. But when trying to sway a voter, yeah. I mean, we're. I mean, you've. Yeah. You well, know, <laughs> it's tough. Look, part of the division and the chaos and 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 these hateful attacks that we've been experiencing, part of that is a strategy to disengage voters and for voters to say. I don't want anything to do with politics. I don't want to vote. I'm tired of all parties. And, mm -hmm. and I, what I tell people is you have so much power. You have so much power to take that, that control over your life, what happens in your local community. We have important races, school board races. Mm -hmm. We have you know state representative races, congressional races, my Senate race. There are a lot of things on the ballot that if you come out and you vote, and you vote the right way, your life will slowly, you'll start seeing the effects of that slowly. But if you stay home, if you completely disengage, which is what a lot of this hateful rhetoric is meant to do, they're doing it strategically so that you stay home. Mm -hmm. If that happens, what's the alternative? We're not gonna have the changes that we need. Mm -hmm. And my question to everyone also is, think of this. We have been under a Republican controlled majority in the state of Florida for over 25 years. What happens in state politics matters and it affects your life. Give some balance to our government. We need to come back to a place where we can be more united and have more balance so that we can improve the lives of the people that are living in our state.